here at Fire Station 2 in Durham, North Carolina, and we're going to take a look around this fire station today and learn what it's like in the day of a firefighter. Uh, this is Fire Station number 2. It was opened in 1950. It's the oldest operating fire station in the city of Durham right now. Uh, it houses Battalion 2, uh, Engine 2, the Technical Rescue Truck, and uh, Ladder 2. This is a uh, 2009 Spartan engine. Uh, it has 500 gallons of water on it and a 1,500 gallon per minute pump. Uh, this truck responds to uh, medical calls, car accidents, fire alarms, and also uh, any type of, of fire, a structure fire, car fire, uh, grass fire. This is Ladder 2. This is the Ladder Company's, uh, this is their main truck. Uh, this truck responds to structure fires, fire alarms, uh, extrications where there's a car accident where somebody's trapped uh, and also rescue calls. Um, it's a 95 foot aerial on it uh, and also they've got uh, close to 100 feet of uh, ground ladders on the truck um, and also the uh, the jaws of life, the extrication equipment. The ladder company uh, also uh, runs the tactical rescue truck. Uh, they're all state certified in tactical rescue and uh, this is the truck that will go if someone is, you know, trapped in a trench that collapsed or they're, uh, you know, trap, uh, trapped up high somewhere, they can do high angle rescue, um, water rescue. So that's what these guys are trained for. You see we've got all our, uh, all different tools we have on the truck. Um, these obviously are mostly firefighting tools. Here we've got all our uh, medical equipment. So we carry, uh, this is a EMT intermediate certified truck. Uh, we can start IVs, uh, push basic drugs like uh, epinephrine, uh, diphenhydramine, that, that type of thing, and uh, give breathing treatments, uh, all that kind of stuff. The firefighters sit in the back and the, uh, the technician and the captain sit up front. Uh, and again here, I've got everything laid out the same way uh, all the time. Uh, my, my pants and my boots there, my radio and my hood here, my coat's there, my helmet's there. Everything's laid out just the way I want it. Um, whenever we get back, I make sure that this is all this in the exact same place. Something that is becoming more and more prominent in the fire service is the, the computer you see there. Um, we can do all of our... Uh, all of our communication with dispatch is done through that computer now, uh, mostly. If there's specifics we need, we'll talk to them on the radio, but any updates they get, they send, us, send it to us through the radio. We can check on scene and check in route, um, and also we can see what all the other trucks are doing in the city. This is the, uh, the SCBA, or self-contained breathing apparatus, just like scuba, only not underwater. So now I'm just breathing the air right out of the tank. Um, so like I said, everything's contained. Um, and it's also, it's, it's positive pressure. So even if I was, if there was a leak, air pushes out. So even if there is a little leak, air won't get in. It's designed to keep a positive pressure in here. The, uh, the sound you just heard, this here is called, it's called a, uh, a pass device. It's a personal alert safety system. Uh, this is so if a firefighter uh, gets knocked out or is trapped, this will eventually alarm, and if that, we know if we hear that, we know that, that someone's in trouble, and that's, so, that's to help us locate someone who's down. Okay, so these are uh, the boots and our, and our pants. Uh, every firefighter in America keeps their boots like this. Um, it's, just, it's much faster. You just step into them, pull up the suspenders, and you're into them. Uh, the, I'll be able to show you the materials a little better on the coat. The coat and the, and the pants are made out of the same material. Uh, this outside uh, is what gives us our, uh, as our, our protection as far as you know, like getting cut and torn. Uh, it's a very tough material. It's made with Kevlar. Um, and it also won't burn. Uh, and it's got uh, reflective on it so that easier to see, see each other Inside of a house, you know, you're when, with, uh, with the flashlights, it's very dark inside of a house if it's on fire. And also, uh, if we're out on the, on the highway for a car accident. The next layer that you'd come to is, uh, it's a, a vapor barrier. 
Uh, it's to keep uh, water off of it, water and steam. Uh, that's actually what causes most firefighters burns is steam. Because uh, water expands uh, 1,200 times when it, when it converts to, uh, to vapor. Um, so a little bit of water in a confined space will turn into a lot of steam and, and can burn you. So that's, what, that's why we've got this vapor barrier in there. And then this is the thermal lining. And that's what provides the bulk of our thermal protection. Um, it does a very good job of keeping heat out, but it also keeps heat in. Um, so especially in the summer like this, we've got to um, keep an eye out for, uh, for heat exhaustion and, stay, and make sure we stay hydrated. So that is the, that, that's the, the bulk of our gear. Uh, and then this is a, a Nomex hood uh, that, that we wear um, and that covers our, our neck and our ears. The helmet, um, again, uh, you know, it's, its main purpose is obviously the, the rigidity of it to uh, protect from falling. Also, the large, uh, the brim and, and with it being large on the back is to keep wa hot water from running down the, the back of the collar um, and, and burning. Uh, some of us have uh, extra stuff on our helmet, like I, I've got a couple of, of, of door wedges in there and then I've got a, a light on mine. Um, and also something nice about these helmets is they have uh, eye protection built in. And the last piece of the ensemble besides the, uh, the air pack obviously uh, is, is our gloves. And again, flame retardant heat resistant. So how long do you have to put on this equipment when you are called out to a fire? For Captain Smith, I've got five seconds less than it takes him. I'd, I, I better beat him on the truck. <laughs> so you have the standing record? <laughs> about, four, about 40 seconds. It, in the academy, we do it over and over and over. And there is a, you have to do it in one minute, um, but it's definitely a competition between all of us of who can get it on first. This is really heavy. Uh, so this is a training maze uh, that some of the firefighters that worked here built on their own. Uh, it's to help us get familiar and comfortable with working in confined spaces, uh, low to no visibility, uh, working through obstacles, uh, getting familiar with our air packs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not so much a simulation of a building, but it's it presents a lot of obstacles for us to overcome and it's to, so that we can build those skills. We've got some, some rope lights in there on uh, so that we can see, uh, but normally they'd be off and we'll have uh, complete darkness in there. Again, something that, uh, that the firefighters here uh, built uh, to train on, uh, it's to simulate a uh, working on a roof uh, and up there in the hole, we, uh, it's cut to fit a pallet. Um, so we'll throw a pallet in there and we can practice uh, doing uh, vertical ventilation, cutting a hole in a roof, um, which is something that, uh, that a ladder company will typically do, but an engine company could be tasked to do it. We all have to know how to do it. Um, what you use is either an ax. Um, this, would be, uh, this would be your backup, um, the backup to the saw. The saw is obviously a lot faster um, and easier uh, but if the saw won't start, if it's too smoky and it chokes it out, then you've got to do it manually. Again, the purpose of cutting a hole in a roof uh, for uh, when we're fighting fire is to uh, release heat and smoke from the, from the structure. We do that to improve survivability for the, uh, anybody that's trapped inside. Also, we can then kind of control where the fire goes or at least know where the fire is going to travel 
and it also makes it easier for us to work inside. Uh, it improves visibility, uh, and also it takes heat out of, the, out of the structure. It makes it easier to work. Like I said, the, the saw is gonna be our primary. We would start it up on the ground and, and then carry it, and carry it up here. We would start with a cut across the top, a cut down here, and then we, we, work, we work towards ourselves. So now we're cutting here, and then, we'd continue, and then we'd finish our cut here. And we would have a pike pole up here to then uh, knock that down, or we would peel the roof up and then knock down the ceiling underneath us to let all that ho uh, heat and smoke out. And you saw with the way I cut here, there, down, and then this last one, we're never standing in what we cut. This is a, a relatively uh, low pitch. Um, if it's a higher pitch, um, we would have we would have a roof ladder on this, which is a, a ladder with hooks at the top. We'd push the push the hooks up to over the eaves. That way, we would have a ladder to walk on, especially with a with a steeper roof. Um, if it's a real steep roof, we might have to get down and you know almost use it like that to climb. But something like this, you can just walk around on, especially those of us that are more comfortable on roofs. What I consider uh, a training facility uh, for us is our weight room that we've got down here. We all consider it very important to stay uh, in very good shape. Uh, she found out earlier how heavy uh, and hot all that gear is. It, it's very draining uh, to work in that and we have to be able to make sure that we're in good shape so that we can do the work we have to. So when the tones go off that we just heard, what happens next? Uh, we all head to the trucks. Um, we'll have heard on the radio first the pre-alert, like they'll say, structure fire at the corner of Broad and West Club Boulevard. And we'll hear that, we know that's in our district, so we'll start heading to the trucks. Um, and those tones go off, and then they repeat all the information, uh, and then we, we head out. Uh, but the tones are there so that if, they, if it comes in as an obscure street, that you, don't go, that you don't go to very often, or if it's something outside of your district, uh, but that you're responding to uh, anyways, those tones go off to let you know that your station has a call, and they, you head to your truck, uh, and then by the time you get to the truck, they'll come over the radio again and repeat all the information so you know what you're going to. And when we're on a fire scene, the engine company is responsible for getting water supply and then getting water on the fire. That's, that's what the engine does. The ladder company, uh, on a fire scene, they're responsible for ventilation, search and rescue, uh, forcible entry, things like that. Um, so the engine company is doing their stuff and the ladder company is doing all of their stuff to, to support the engine company. We're here for 24 hours. I got here at 7 in the morning and we'll leave here at 7 next morning. So we need a kitchen, we need a living room, we need beds. Um, and here at Station 2, that's, uh, that's all up here upstairs. Uh, we've got our kitchen, uh, our table. We all, um, we all eat together, especially lunch and, lunch and dinner. Everybody eats together. Um, and uh, this is where, you know, if, we're, if we've got downtime, we'll hang out, hang out here. Uh, also here we've got uh, some couches and a TV. Uh, if in the evening, uh, you know, we've got all our work done, we want to uh, relax and hang out if, if we're not on any calls. Uh, we can hang out here. Uh, this is my room. Uh, and it's just a bed and a locker for your stuff and a TV. Uh, I share it with the two guys on the two different shifts. So we've each got our own locker, um, and we're all, you know, so we're all responsible for making the room is making sure the room is clean. One other thing that I was curious about is if you have to treat any calls differently than others, is your pro does your protocol change if there's evidence that a fire may be incendiary or intentionally set? Uh, when we come up on a fire, uh, at first, we're probably not going to treat it any differently. If there's things that we see that make us suspicious, uh, we might tread lightly uh, and uh, be a little more careful while we're making our advance into the home in case it is booby-trapped or anything like that, if it's suspected arson. But mostly when that would come in is after we have the fire out while we're overhauling the house. If we see uh, suspicious things like 
um, you know, a trail of, of charred uh, wood you know, through the house where it looks like liquid was on the ground burning. We'll, you know, we're conscientious of that and we'll make sure to try not to destroy evidence. But that's why we have fire investiga investigators on 24-7 and also we can call in more uh, from off duty and they're the ones that handle all the investigation and determine cause and origin and all that. One last question. I haven't seen a Dalmatian wandering around anywhere. Uh, is, is, he, is he in a cubby somewhere? What's up with that? Uh, no, we don't have a Dalmatian. Uh, none of the stations at Durham do. Uh, but they actually used to uh, have Dalmatians at fire stations for a purpose. Uh, there was the, the purpose that they serve now as a, as a station mascot, um, but also they would guard the station while the firefighters were out, and they would also, they were kind of a, uh, uh, a guard and a companion for the horses back in the days when the fire apparatus were drawn by horse. So if a student was interested in becoming a firefighter, what would be your advice? Uh, my advice first is to get a degree. Um, it's becoming more and more a profession, the fire services, rather than a uh, skilled trade like it used to be. Um, so you, you'll get points on your application for having a degree, and when you go up for promotion, if you want to promote in the fire service, you almost have to have a degree. Um, and especially if you ever want to move up to a chief officer position and move up, you have to have at least a bachelor's. And by the time that any, anybody that's a student now, by the time they're in a position to promote to a chief, they'll probably need a master's degree. Um, so I would start off with getting an associate's degree. I'd suggest in uh, fire science, uh, emergency medicine, uh, public administration, emergency management, things like that. Um, that would be my first step.